We have Christopher Allison, who is the New Markets Tax Credit Program Manager. We have Oscar Gonzalez, who is our Acting Financial Strategies and Research Manager. For those who know Greg Bishak, Greg retired from the CDFI Fund um, back in May. And we have Trevor Henry, who's one of our Associate Program Managers who focuses solely on New Markets Tax Credit Program. And I think when we talk about best practices, Trevor may have us beat in terms of time with the fund. So he may be the resource to, to uh, answer all those questions. I think he also knows the CDEs better than we know ourselves, since he's the one that <laughs> digs into all of the compliance stuff that we submit. I was wondering if we could start by asking Christopher the question that you hinted at earlier. I know the CDFI fund likes to talk about seasons when you would plan to have announcements made. Wonder if Christopher would like to talk in any more detail about the forthcoming new markets application as he gives us some other thoughts about what he's working on these days. Great, Thank, thanks, Meryl. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so uh, as far as the current round, you know, we're currently in the process of reviewing uh, the 2020 allocation applications. And, you know, basically I can report out that we're on pace to announce those allocations this summer as planned. Um, I'll also go ahead and say, you know, we, we, we plan to open the 2020 application round in late summer or early fall. Um, I'm also often asked how many awards the CDFI fund will make given the increase of allocation to 5 billion in authority. We're still working through that, uh, through the evaluation, but I think it's reasonable to look at past allocation rounds where 5 billion in tax credit authority was available. So for example, around 100 NNTC awards were made in 2008 and 2009 as a result of additional tax credit authority authorized by the Recovery Act. So all that to say, at the same time, <laughs> it depends on the quality of applications we received. And, and, in, and in the end, the CDFI fund will take into account the number of highly qualified applications and each applicant's ability to manage and deploy that allocation. That's great. As you all are getting into the final phases of review this year, are there any trends or things that you're seeing that you think are notable about this round that catch your eye compared to prior rounds? Um, well, I think we'll probably have more to say once we get to the award announcement. I will say that it has been interesting. You know, this is the first round since the pandemic started. And so it's clear to me that people did put, even though you know, the applications were due last fall, everything was relatively new. There was obviously lots of un uncertainty uh, that folks did put some thought into how that is changing or how the pandemic in general is changing their specific strategies, the needs in the communities that they serve. So I really uh, appreciate the responsiveness um, and I would just note on the on COVID as well, you know, we sort of heard loud and clear at the time some of the re requests for flexibility from the industry, whether it was about reporting requirements or um, sort of shifts in business strategy. And we tried to quickly or as quickly as we can in the federal government respond to some of those needs So we did put out additional guidance. So I would say that's my big takeaway right now. Obviously, there's a lot going on and a lot has changed. So I appreciate the responsiveness and that people are thinking hard about these issues. And Christopher, one other question for you while you're already on the hot seat. I know you're trying to work on this round and the next one all at the same time. And this was a year that you took question, or questions or feedback from the broader field and putting together next year's application, even though that's all under the auspices of Paperwork Reduction Act and whatever that's supposed to mean, none of us really understand what your job's supposed to be there. But I know a lot of organizations like ours took the opportunity to give you feedback and comments on other things that probably would add to the paperwork, not reduce it. Um, and as you all sort through 
the feedback that you're getting and you know your experience working on this program over time have you been able to come to a final point of view of what feedback you'll be able to include and what you may have to pick up in a future change to the application sure uh let me uh sort of take a step back first and then i'll i'll, I'll uh address your your specific question so uh, i think as everyone knows the cdfi fund published a request for public comment on the allocation application in December of 2020. Uh, in March, we received 43 letters that included over 200 unique public comments. So first I wanna say I really appreciate the robust response we received, and it's given us a lot to think about and consider. Uh, the purpose of the uh, request for public comments, as you said, Merrill, was specifically focused on burden in completing the allocation application. And it's required by the Paperwork Reduction Act or PRA. Um, but it, that is not the only use of your comments. So I'm, I'm really happy that folks didn't necessarily just focus on that burden aspect. So, you know, we received comments requesting clarification of the application questions, the exhibits, uh, and as a result of that, we made a number of revisions to that to the application template. Those revisions have been submitted to the Office of Management and Budget for final approval. So I, I just want to be clear that the proposed changes are not final until that review is complete, and it's still currently in process. So the final template will be published when the 2021 round opens. At the same time, and I think this gets more to your, your direct question, Meryl, uh, we also received a number of comments related to the application review process and criteria and other important policy issues. So, you know, I just want to assure everyone that those comments are still being considered and will continue to be considered as the fund clarifies our guidance makes future policy decisions. Um, so we sort of, you know, we had to go through all of them, sort of pour over the details. Um, some of it you will see in the, the 2021 application when it's released. Uh, some of it you will see show up in guidance and some of it is gonna take more thought uh, uh, and sort of decision-making around policy uh, to, to determine whether we're going to implement some of those really good ideas. So, uh, you know, at a very high level, there were a number of changes. I'm, I'm not going to go through those right now, but I would like to talk a little bit about um, some of the comments, and we've gotten comments over the years, particularly related to our efforts um, in regards to new and emerging CDEs, particularly minority CDEs, and our efforts to invest, to, sorry, to increase NMTC investment in Indian country. So I want to start with some historical con context on the success rates of mi minority CDEs in the application process. A Government Accountability Office report from 2009 found that only 9% of minority CDEs were successful in the early rounds of the program, compared to 27% for non-minority CDEs. If you look at the past three rounds, 2017 to 2019, minority CDs had a success rate of 31% compared to 35% for non-minority CDs. I'm providing this data to share that these discrepancies have improved significantly since the GAO study in 2009, but there's still a lot, of, lot more work to be done. So as many of you know, the CDFI fund sponsored a training and technical assistance initiative for minority CDEs in 2017. At the same time, the CDFI fund combined the 2015-2016 application rounds to award $7 billion in allocation authority. I believe that both of those efforts had some impact on the increase in minority CDE participation of the program. And based on the recent public comments provided by the industry, we're continuing to look at ways to increase access for new and emerging CDEs, particularly those that are native owned and minority owned. And we've proposed uh, a few of the ideas that were in the, com in the comments we received. So one is a new innovative activity that encourages applicants to commit to invest 
allocation in unaffiliated minority and native CDEs to help build the experience of new and emerging CDEs. If the applicant commits to this innovative, innovative activity, then that commitment will, will be, become a condition of their allocation agreement. So I'm hoping that this will result in new partnerships between existing allocatees and emerging minority and native CDEs. We also included a new community outcome for financing Native American businesses, which may face challenges that are unique uh, to those businesses. Finally, I just wanna to touch on a uh, request for information uh, that the CDFI fund published uh, last month. Uh, and this is related to an upcoming procurement that is part of a broader effort to increase NMTC investment in federal Indian reservations, off-reservation trust lands, Hawaiian homelands, and Alaska Native Village statistical areas. So I'm just going to call those NMTC Native areas for shorthand. So the CDFI fund will require a contractor to perform preliminary research and analysis, plan, coordinate, and administer a survey, develop a self-assessment guide, and plan and coordinate and facilitate technical workshops. And these technical workshops will be targeted to certified CDEs that are native owned or controlled, native CDFIs, and other tribal entities that focus on investing in these NMTC native areas. So collectively, these efforts are expected to increase the CDFI funds understanding of best practices from past NMTC investments in these communities. The self-assessment guide and technical workshops will also provide a variety of strategies and tools for existing and potential native CDEs to successfully participate in the program. So the RFI was due on June 2nd. Uh, based on those responses, uh, you know, we expect to publish a request for proposals soon to continue the process uh, with activities expected to start in calendar year 2022. There's a lot of information there and I'm gonna change my mind again because I actually would like to pull the thread a little bit before I hand off the, your mic to somebody else. So I appreciate you sharing the additional data about the success rate of minority owned CDEs. I wonder if you also have the information about the percentage of applicants. Uh, one thing we hear a lot in the industry where a CDE that's participated since round one. So we'll hear people say there's a first mover advantage in the program because then you're building a track record and it matches the way the tables work. So that's great for me. That's not great for an organization that's never done new markets before. Um, do you know with the data you currently have available, whether the number of minority controlled CDE applicants, owned CDE applicants has also gone up at the same time the percentage has gone up or is the percentage getting better because some people are like, uh, this isn't working, I'm not gonna apply anymore. In a super simplistic way. It's a really good question. That. It's, it's, it's actually a question I got last week. So, and I went and looked up the answer. So what I can say, you know, you, you have to look at the total application pool, which has variability in it, right? So the proportion of minority CDEs that have applied uh, is the same proportion going back to 2009. Now that raises another question, right? Which is what efforts, you know, we are doing, the industry is doing to pull in new actors, new minority, potential minority CDEs into the program, which is also a fair question. Um, but, you know, I can confirm that the, the success rates have gone up while the proportion of minority CD applicants has stayed relatively stable you know, since 2008, 2009, through the combined round and to present day. That's great, thank you. Well, I'm gonna give Trevor a chance to be on the hot seat now because I know that the person we talk about the most internally is how to keep Trevor happy um, as we are submitting all of our compliance related things and um, he works very closely I know with many CDEs to make sure that we're doing everything we're supposed to. So Trevor, are there things you'd like to share with the industry that you're working on these days that we need to know about so we keep in good standing with you? Um, 
a couple of things. Um, I, I'd like to start just giving you a quick update of what, what we've done over the last year or so. Um, within the compliance unit, um, you know, from a manager perspective, one of the things that most of you have noticed that um, Todd Ta McGinnis used to serve as our compliance manager over, over the last few years and, you know, duty calls and Jody needed her to do some work on small dollar loan program and our minority depository institution initiatives. And so we lost her <laughs> to that effort, but um, Heather Hunt has stepped in, in, in that role acting as um, the compliance manager. And similar, Michelle Dickens and most of you have met, talked to probably as it relates to CDE certification is also acting in that role as CDE and CDFI sort of certification manager. So as a unit, you know, we're continuing to um, focus on sort of cross-training. And part of that is trying to get our audit staff, you know, up to speed on what we do on the new market side of things. And the cross-training is also to help us pivot towards areas of need. Right now, new markets, uh, uh, small dollar loan programs, those are things that are going on. So at times we need our staff to do other things. So cross-training has a lot of benefits to us and to you because we're able to move our resources around to address those needs. Um, and then some, somewhat underpinning this effort is, you know, we're trying to have a dedicated staff person for each organization. And we want that staff person to start, at, you know, to be the sort of initial point of contact. And that is to ensure that, you know, as issues arise, um, whether it be reporting issues or material events, that we address that in a holistic manner so that not only we sort of focus on how does that affect new markets, but also the other programs that you may be involved in. And currently, um, each organization um, that is in Amos that has an allocation has a staff person that is dedicated to that organization. Um, and if you look in, in Amos, uh, there is a, we call the portfolio manager, that person's name and email appears on the allocation page. So, but rest assured, um, uh, I'm still part of, of the team. Um, I'm considered the subject matter expert. Uh, Bridget Weir is also part of the team. And the one who I'm pretty sure a lot of you may have <laughs> met through emails that she's asking questions about, you know, you know, reporting or data clarification. So we're still continuing to be sort of the sort of the back backstop for in terms of new markets um, expertise, but we're trying to get the rest of the team along so that we can have more bodies to do compliance. That's great. I think CDEs really appreciate knowing who their primary point of contact is. Do you have any best practices you want to share with us about, I know we're supposed to submit an AMOS service request, but when do we do that? And we uh, dial a friend and try to get a live person connected to us to help with any issue that may arise. Uh, we, we prefer the service request as a first stop because that's a good way of it. You know, service request is easy for us to move around from one person to the next if somebody's not there. There is a repository with, you know, within, the C, within the compliance unit that we can say, hey, we need you to go look at this particular service request. And it, it's, for our purposes, it's a lot easier to address service requests um, than it is to have a phone call or an email because they tend to get lost. Um, you know, and one of the things about, that's good about service requests, it, you know, if it requires you know, additional input, not just from us, but maybe from the, the, the new markets team or even um, Oscar sometimes may have, you know, may be able to give us some insight about, hey, you know, this particular issue, um, service requests are a good way because we can move that around your organization a little easier. So I would start off with service requests and we go from there. And as usual, if we were taking too long, just drop me an email and we'll get back to you. We try to be as, you know, as timely in our response as we can. That's great. I know for CDEs who've been at this for a while, just having a place that you've got one portal and you know everything about your CDE in one place has made things a lot easier. So the more that we're getting connected to your system, and then we have a record of it too, right? We know when we've reached out and that stuff's in process because sometimes we have a 630 fiscal year end. A lot of CDEs have a 1231 fiscal year end. We're on different reporting cycles and knowing that we have it um, kind of the, the direct line and the backup through all the technology is helpful for us. Trevor, one more question for you, thinking about like differences in fiscal year ends, is you're able to improve the technology and how the TLR is working. Are y'all looking at, and especially inputting more data sooner about what's going on with our projects? Are you all looking at changing any of the current deadlines that you have for when we submit information? 
we're not looking to change the deadline. So typically, um, you know, 180 days after fiscal year end, that's when your TLR and ILR are due. But what we did do was to implement, and uh, I'm pretty sure Austin can chime in on this at some point. We did implement what we call the interim certification. And um, and that's really related to the application round, so we can sort of timestamp and sort of validate the information. But interim sort of the system, Amos is flexible enough to allow you to, as you go along, as you close your transaction, you can actually record um, that project, that note, that address, those disbursements related to that particular transaction. So the system is flexible um, enough in that respect. And, you know, I, I think it's, you know, the comment that I've gotten from the industry is like, oh, this is helpful. That means I don't have to wait until you know 30 days prior to the, to the, the reports being due to actually get my information in so you can get a head start by using you know that those features because you can live as as you close transactions you can actually record those in the system now as you go along well that sounds a little bit like crazy talk to me because i think the thing that the cdf that that cdes know the best about new markets is that it's very deadline driven. So uh, we, we rely heavily on you all to set some deadlines for us to get stuff done. So um, I'm just joking. I know my compliance manager is always ahead of your deadlines, but um, we, we appreciate you not moving them up on us. I'll at least say that if we can opt into it, but not have a mandatory requirement that helps. Um, Oscar, I'd love to turn to you for a little bit. Um, my best understanding for what you do is that you get to be the data junkie about all this vast information that the CDFI fund knows about all of us and what we do. I'd love to hear more about how you describe that work and any changes that you see coming up in this next year. Great. So first of all, you know, I want to say it's a privilege to be here at the New Market Tax Credit Coalition. As you know, Greg Bishop retired at the end of May. And since June, I have been an acting manager for the Financial Strategies and Research Unit at the CDFI Fund. So I've been at the fund for a decade now. So I worked with Craig Bishak for 10 years since 2011. And he left me uh, a lot of uh, his boxes, you know, but uh, over the last decade, I have to say, I have been very, you know, we have the data, but I've been very inspired by all the work and projects that, uh, you know, a lot of you have been doing in low-income communities. You know, these, these are... Some of these are remarkable projects, very transformational. So um, previously, I used to work at the uh, Congressional Research Service for the U.S. Congress in the legislative branch. And, uh, you know, over our, uh, half a decade there, you know, there's a lot of respect in Congress for what CDFIs do. And I think, you know, uh, the data you give us is a lot of the information we feed back to Congress. And I think there is, a, a, you know, a, a virtuous cycle from that um, you know, from the information you report to us and how we see you and how the um, how we report that information out there as well. On the data front, I'll follow up on uh, some of the questions that uh, uh, Trevor addressed on interim certification at, at the transactional level reporting. Uh, first, uh, the CDFI fund would like to acknowledge the issues experienced early in the year with the interim TLR reporting, and would like to thank everyone, all of you, for reporting those issues. We have implemented a fix that addressed those issues, and we uh, don't expect uh, those issues uh, at that scale next year. And as Treffer said, interim certification was envisioned as a mechanism to timestamp and validate the new TLR so that we get you know, real-time information from all of you about what's going on instead of waiting the 180 days. Um, uh, and uh, a couple of uh, issues is uh, an allocate that makes uh, Quilikis to other CDEs will need to provide two sets of data in the TLR. The first record is the initial investment from the allocatee to CDEB, and the second set of data are the loans and investments that CDEB then undertakes. The new data points will require the allocatee to indicate if a project was the result of the investment in the CDE and also capture the new market tax credit project number associated with uh, CDEB. And uh, other functionalities included uh, the ability to do uh, bulk uploads uh, for addresses and uh, financial notes and disbursements via a, you know, uh, sort of like a CSV file where you can put all the bulk transactions and the use of latitude and longitudes to report project addresses in the, in the territories. Uh, minor validations to ensure that the reported flexible rates and terms for the Qualiki are better than the standard market rates uh, and terms. Uh, so those are sort of like uh, the, some of the major issues with the interim certification. Um, in addition, you know, one of the things uh, we're exploring now is uh, 
sort of, you know, updating some of that information on what makes a low income community. And, uh, you know, potentially uh, analyzing, you know, the a transition from the data that we have now from 2011 to 2015, five year data from the American Community Survey to 2016, 20 data, uh, which, um, you know, uh, will come out uh, in December of 2021. And the fund is basically analyzing all that information at this point. We don't have uh, uh, specific dates because, you know, we sort of want to incorporate a lot of that information of, you know, of what's a, a non-metropolitan non rural area, for example. Um, and uh, users, you know, can basically refer to past CDFI fund guidance on how we've done these transitions in the past. I'm curious on the definition of low-income community as you think about the challenges so many communities have had in the last year since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Is Do you all have the ability to have more granular information that might be related to very current conditions in communities? Or are we all wedded to these five and 10 year chunks of big data about what conditions are in different census tracts? Yeah, so uh, right now, the reason we use uh, sort of like the mid decade updates is that, um, you know, we're a small organization and, um, you know, we basically have to sort of work with Trevor, you know, and he can keep track of uh, all the information that we provide him so that, you know, so he can check compliance. You know, in the ideal world, we could do it more often, but given, you know, sort of like IT constraints, costs, you know, we have the mapping system and that we have to coordinate with all the programs, you know, we sort of uh, are following this, this, this five year. Um, update, but you're right. I mean, there are um, major, major issues right now in terms of how COVID is affecting uh, low-income communities, you know, uh, and I think, you know, if you look in the literature, uh, you will see that it has, you know, affected some uh, uh, communities disproportionately and that, uh, you know, uh, right now we, everything is sort of propped with uh, stimulus funding, but, you know, what'll happen after that sort of dries out. So those are important questions to address. Yeah, I wonder if there will be an uptick in targeted population transactions. That may be a way that CDEs try to approach being more current in what a low-income person's needs might be, even if the census tract data hasn't changed yet. So that may give you some more fun facts to be tracking over the next few years. Um, speaking of fun, um, sometimes fun, we understand that there's a new opportunity to for the CDFI fund to look at risk ratings of CDEs, and some of us are not affiliated with financial institutions. Some people have a ton of experience in that. So, uh, Trevor, I think this might be in your bailiwick. What do you all have in mind for how that process is going to work and what CDEs need to be prepared for? Yeah, we are still in a very early process, sort of stage of trying to put something together. Um, you know, part of it, so where, where we're coming from is a matter of resources again, you know, limited staff. Um, how do you then identify um, potentially which, where, where to spend your time from a compliance standpoint? Uh, and so this is something we envision as being a way to like pinpoint, okay, these are the groups we want to spend more time with, or we want to take a, a, a sort of a deeper dive uh, exactly, you know, what they're doing. Um, so our initial concept was this is to look at, you know, what are the sort of the past or past activities or, or past um, information that would sort of lend you know, credence towards, you know, hey, this particular group may be at a higher risk. So looking at your past compliance history, um, looking at sort of the composition of, of those particular organizations and see there's a correlation. This is where Oscar will come in because <laughs> we can use his statistical analysis to help us do some of that. And we also have, there's a financial aspect to this, which, you know, we're on the CDFI side of things, um, they use it as part of the application. So we're hoping to sort of borrow some of that information from, you know, financial risks to a certain extent and sort of this historic information about our compliance data to figure out, okay, here's a risk profile for this particular CDE um, and how we would sort of look at that from a compliance standpoint. But again, this is very early, um, so there's not much report at, at this time. So speaking of ways that you all get to understand CDEs better, in a prior role, I got to participate in a CDFI fund site visit, which was great for us to be able to see people face to face and take you to one of our projects and talk about the work that we did. I recognize 
a lot of us are hiding places. You can't, <laughs> I'm pretending to be in Baltimore today, at one of our new markets projects, but our site visits on the agenda for later this year and the next year. So you all will get to see CDEs in person again. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So there's there's no current plans to do site visits. I think given the, uh, you know, everybody is sort of getting comfortable with the new normal. Uh, also, you know, with the 5 billion in allocation, uh, you know, that bump up has also, a lot of our resources has go, have gone to that as opposed to sort of planning, which there's quite a bit of planning on our part, as well as the CDEs that we visit, which I, I always say, you know, I wanna acknowledge that and appreciate the work that goes into it because really with a program office does a site visit, we're really trying to better understand what's happening on the ground, how you underwrite deals, how you close deals, to make sure that what we are asking in the application and evaluating sort of reflects the changing practices on the ground and some of the innovations that are happening in the field. So I don't, don't anticipate anything this year, but it's something that we feel pretty strongly about, about the benefits of it. Um, so I imagine, you know, we will likely do them uh, in 2022. Great, we look forward to seeing you. Speaking of innovation, I've always wondered why when you ask us in the application about what innovative things we do, you give us a discrete list to choose among, and there's no longer a choose your own adventure option in the community outcome question either. So how, how are you able to identify innovation in the field when the application has its own structure for gathering information, which I recognize you need to be able to compare and contrast different CDEs. How do you balance those two things? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there was this sort of more open-ended choose your own adventure, but I would say at the same time, those sort of implied certain innovative things, right? It wasn't just totally free form. I think we realized, and I, I think this was 2012, 2013, so it's been a while, um, but there were certain activities that are eligible uses of new markets and that are needs of businesses in low-income communities that we weren't seeing happen. And we were seeing a lot of folks creating a very similar business model and doing very similar types of activities. So we sort of grouped together a number of different issues. One, uh, the geographic diversity within the program. So with both these sort of identified states that have seen less investment, uh, Indian country, which has obviously seen less investment in this program. Also from uh, the financing needs of businesses, right? So if we were seeing predominantly real estate activities and this sort of question of how we would incentivize folks to do operating businesses you know, working capital, things like that, equipment purchases, which are harder to do and more riskier in certain ways. Um, so that's sort of the genesis of those activities. You know, it's also because we need to be able to hold people accountable to what they say they're going to do if we are going to get results from those activities. So all of those activities flow through to the allocation agreement, which makes them inherently sort of a more prescribed thing. That doesn't mean, and I, maybe this is a little bit of a branding issue, innovative activities, that doesn't mean that we don't think other things that the industry is doing are innovative, right? I mean, we are reading about those in your applications and I, I would like to encourage you to keep doing those things, um, but this is about addressing specific policy issues and ensuring accountability to those issues. You mentioned that you're able to use the innovative Kaliki question and some other levers in the application to encourage certain types of activities. I know a lot of CDEs like ours spend a lot of time trying to read between the lines and see if you are hinting obviously or not obviously at things you really want us to do. Um, and I've worked for a CDE that exclusively does small business lending and for a CDE that exclusively does adaptive reuse of historic buildings. 
And so I've been on both ends of this. Maybe the CDFI fund is telling us they don't like this fundamental part of how we finance community re revitalization. Uh, would you like to disabuse us of any of those notions we have of trying to read the tea leaves and imagine what you want us to be doing? I wish I could disabuse everyone of all of them, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, going back to, I think it was a question you asked Jody at the beginning, like what has the CDFI fund learned or what, have we, what do we value in this program? I think one of those things is the flexibility and the broad uses. And so a lot of, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to make sure that the program remains flexible and that the program can address a diversity of needs on the ground. So, you know, when I hear rumors that, oh, the CDFI fund really wants X, that is often misguided. I mean, our, our guidance is, is pretty clear. You know, we say explicitly, we don't prefer one outcome over another. We don't prefer one business type over another. I mean, obviously it has to qualify. Obviously it has to have a strong benefit to low-income people, you know, those are the things that we're evaluating. And so there is not like a, oh, the CDFI fund really wants us to do this this year, right? Which I've, I've heard before. Um, and it's just not accurate. So I think the key to many successful applications is defining your business strategy and the impact that you're gonna have on specific communities through specific projects and a strategy that aligns throughout, right? As opposed to picking something that you think we want to hear, right? That sounds great, because I don't think I'm really good at knowing what you want to hear, so I'm, I'm better at telling you what I want you to hear. Um, so, so we'll stick with that approach. Uh, we have a question from an expert in the audience, Mr. Raposa, who would like to know whether you all have seen a change in projects over the years. Um, so maybe that's a question for Oscar with his deep knowledge of all the different data collected by the program. Um, and I know it's something the Urban Institute was also looking at. Are there any notable trends you all see in project types over time? Uh, well, if you look at our public data online, you'll see, you know, uh, and you sort of, it's all right on our website and you tabulate the data by year, you'll see, like Christopher saying, you know, really there's a, a, a great growth and diversity across the whole nation. So it's really targeting the entire country. And, uh, you know, when we send some of these maps to Congress, they love, they know their neighborhoods, they know where the low income areas are. They can really tell, you know, what, what the impacts of those projects are. And, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, if you go in, into Google Scholar, you know, we're sort of uh, aware of the urban evaluation, you know, and uh, um, basically, you know, we thank the Urban Institute for conducting that information. I know uh, Paul Anderson's here, you know, uh, his, uh, the coalition has a list of stratified projects that are very useful as well. But uh, I would say, you know, the trends are towards, you know, a wide diversity of projects across multiple geographies uh, across, across different years. And targeting multiple areas of distress. I think uh, one statistic that was interesting, you know, is that I think half, a lot, half of the projects are going to minority communities or, you know, majority minority communities. So I think that is, uh, you know, it's both good and bad because it sort of shows that, you know, poverty is racially concentrated, but the new market is trying to address some of those issues by, you know, providing sort of uh, uh, projects that, that, you know, combine strategy that's aligned. You know, you see some of these, uh, I drive around DC and on, I, I saw the, uh, you know, the co-location of one of the projects, you know, in the diamond of DC that had, you know, healthcare and job training and uh, uh, schooling, uh, homeless services. So it's, I think, you know, it's uh, that sort of diversity of projects that, you know, combines multiple strategies. I think that's one of the, that's, that's one of the important trends, you know, that you see as well. That's great. A companion question regarding trends. I know for CDEs like ours that got allocation in the last round, we had a really busy fall and winter and people have gotten a lot of allocation out. Looks like the QEI issuance is running just a little shy of $2 billion um, for amount of the most recent awards already put out on the street. How does that compare to prior years? Are we doing better or worse, even in a pandemic situation and getting recent allocation out the door? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't have that 
comparison in front of me. And I, I think it does um, vary from, because there are these seasonal effects, right, based on the QEI issuance deadlines in the application. I imagine the end of the tax year for investors as well. So it's, I think it's a bit noisy. I think we'd have to go back and do a bit more analysis uh, to be able to tease out some of those. I mean, clearly deployment is happening. I think <laughs> I had that question at the beginning of the pandemic, and it seems that folks have under very trying circumstances. And I know, you know, different investor appetite has shifted, um, but it's clear that deals are still getting done, which I think is a big benefit to low-income communities and to all of the work that we do. I don't, I don't have a more specific analysis other than that. I'm sure you're glad for us to give you more homework. Um, one, one comment I will make though on the QEI issuance deadline and your observation about investors as you're putting together the deadlines, I imagine you will give us when we turn around and apply this year is that having a deadline that was in 2021 instead of 2020 was very helpful. We had some investors who did not want any more 2020 tax credits last year. So had the deadline been December 31st instead of January 15th, that would have impacted us. We had several deals ready to close in December and we accommodated our investors preference to close them in January instead. So that helps just having two different tax years of options for investors, especially in a distressed marketplace. You know, and if you wanted to make it February 1st, that'd be fine too. Um, just, just a thought. Well, one, one question for possibly for Jody and maybe for others, since she never escaped um, while we continued to talk. The CDFI fund over the years has done a lot of collaboration with other agencies. You all worked with USDA and how to structure some of their loan products in a way that's compatible with new markets. And it sounds like you've done some work with the Bureau of Indian Affairs related to how new markets might work better in Indian country. We've gotten a question about collaboration with HUD. Are there other interagency things that the CDFI Fund's working on to ensure that new markets can be the most compatible with other federal resources, especially since there are a lot more federal resources now than we had in prior years? Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one and anyone else can, can jump in. So what we're seeing now is as the new uh, administration comes on board, it feels like we've been in this administration for some time now, but we're really only in, in month five. <laughs> but what we see is that there is a huge interest in collaborating and a lot of discussion about how programs fit together how do we communicate and do outreach to the communities that are going to be the recipients or the end beneficiaries of the various uh, resources? And then also looking at the programs to make sure that they work together. So I'm happy to say that you know, there is renewed interest in having those conversations. Right now, the focus has been on the stimulus funding, making sure that any proposals for HUD, you know, the, the CRF funding or anything in the American Jobs Plan also um, ties or works well with the existing programming at the CDFI fund. We have SSBCI, folks may remember that has been um, reborn with a lot more funding. And so there's conversations there. I do think that you all making us aware of some of the issues that you're having in deploying tax credits, new markets tax credits with other programs is always helpful because then we can take that back as part of these interagency conversations that we're in. But right now the focus is on the stimulus funding, but I'm pretty confident that it's gonna to start to move to look at the variety of programs that we have and those conversations of collaboration will start back up again. That sounds great. As a recovering tax credit, lawyer in this field, I will say that it's keeping the lawyers and accountants very busy to try to figure out how these different state and federal resources can work together. And it may be an opportunity to engage with the IRS more directly too, because some of them really relate to how the tax structuring intersects with different rules and requirements. So I think you may have a line out your door with more comments about how to do that. And you know, there's a lot of new appropriation dollars that I think in new markets land, we haven't been used to seeing 
federal money flow in that could be either coming directly or coming through states. Some of it's going to housing, some of it's going to other community revitalization. Do you all have a vision for how that might look with new markets um, or is it too soon to tell? I think it's maybe a little, a little too soon for us to tell how all of the programs will work together. But I will say that, you know, one call of action to the coalition, and, and I know I've spoke, I speak with Bob Raposa uh, pretty frequently on different um, initiatives and ideas that the coalition has, is that as you see these resources developing, and as you see things in the community that we probably don't see sitting at 18th and L, or we're all home now, but you know what I mean, um, to raise those to our attention. I mean, this is People are very interested in what's happening in the CDFI industry with community development entities, with community development in general. And so this, you have an ear, you have an ear with the administration, you have an ear at the CDFI fund, and you have an ear at Congress. And so kind of raising those types of either issues or ideas about how new markets can be a significant tool. It's already a significant tool in many communities, but be a significant tool when matched with other resources, I think is really, is really important. And there may be some things that, you know, we're kind of head deep in the program rounds, we're head deep in compliance and data. And there's just some things that we may not see um, right away. So your ability to raise those issues to us, the letters, the calls, the emails that we receive are really helpful in thinking that through. That's great. One more data related question. I think I might speak on behalf of more than one CDE in saying that the methods and metrics related questions in the community outcome section can be challenging to, to figure out, not because we don't look at our projects with a healthy amount of data, but if you serve more than one population, you might be looking at it in different ways. And if you're looking holistically at the impact, sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly how to slice and dice the information and benchmark it against something where in this case, it actually is our choose your own adventure of choosing the appropriate metric. Now that you all have been gathering this information from applicants in a couple of years, for a couple of years, how are you seeing that transition of adding those requirements to the application? And might we convince you that you don't need to do it anymore? <laughs> well, I'll say just so the genesis, I mean, there were methods and metrics for a long time, right? They were sort of called different things. The basic concept, right, is looking, and I think you said this, the healthy amount of skepticism as well about what's being presented. I mean, you are underwriting these businesses and these real estate projects. And the question becomes, what due diligence are you doing to ensure that those outcomes are realistic, that they're gonna happen, that they're actually gonna have, you know, benefit low-income people, right? So that's sort of the reason why. Um, I think over time, this has sort of evolved and part of the reason that particularly with the third party metrics, um, which, was, which was some guidance that we added, I guess, two years ago now, um, which is really about this, this uh, validation of the information, some sort of validation. Um, and, and the idea here was those were the best responses we saw to these questions. Folks were doing that uh, and they were scoring the highest. And so one of the things that we did was provide guidance to tell you who, <laughs> this is what information, you know, uh, would lead to a higher score. Um, so really it was a part of a transparency um, and sort of getting more gra granular about what we were evaluating. I think at the same time, I, I don't want people to, and I don't even know if this will be effective for me to say, but overthink it. We are not looking for you to do a social science research project to validate a causal relationship or something that these will happen. All we're asking you to do is when you are, when a quality B is proposing certain outcomes are gonna happen, that you're not taking their word for it, that you're doing some due diligence, 
and that you're using some some third party data, whether it's government data, uh, whether it is a third party market study, whether it is um, state and local data or philanthropic data um, to validate that that's even reasonable what's being said, right? Um, so what I will say is we are continuing, you know, since we put that guidance out, we've seen people do lots of different creative things, use all different sorts of sources. I mean, we are looking to provide better examples of the types of methods and metrics that, you know, uh, folks have used so that it's not everybody sort of making this up themselves. And so hopefully that takes some of the burden out. That makes sense to me. I, I will observe that I think for see this, this is the opposite of my observation about the first mover advantage, a, a benefit of a, a participant in the program for more than one year or for a longer period of time is that we have actual data of performance. You know, NTCIC has 95 qualic bees. And so it, it was helpful to be able to say, I believe that this new person is going to do what they say because it compares so similarly to the 95 other people who said they were going to do it and did. Um, so sometimes that's a better comparison than a that than an objective one, but isn't actually related as closely to low-income community investment. But yeah, I defer so to your I expertise. Guess I, say, <laughs> I guess just to close the loop on this, though, it's not an either or. You can use both the question says, or the guidance says, is informed by. So yep. it can be one small component and you can rely heavily on your track record as well. Right? That's great. You, you thoughtfully mentioned the word transparency and we give you a lot of information in our application and with our compliance data. Is the CDFI fund able to give us more information back. I think even when you win in a round, sometimes you don't know why. What made me win last year, but not win the year before, as an example. Um, are you all able to share more information about how applications are scored, both to winners and to losers, beyond just the debriefing document that we receive? Yeah, so uh, I mean, the debriefing document is the main way, and I, and I know it's not the most satisfying document one to receive, but obviously I understand that people want more specific feedback. The challenge we have is there's a couple of issues. One, uh, there's an administrative function here, right? There are 200 something applicants. We cannot meet with every single applicant and tell them you know, give them specific feedback. The second component of that is an issue of fairness, right? So we need to provide the same information to everyone, right? So just because you talked to us on this date, we gave you some sort of, you know, even if accidentally give you some sort of information or even the perception of different information. So the debriefing document is a way to standardize that. I am open to you know, other ideas about what information, you know, the industry would like to see. Um, you know, there have been changes over the years, you know, that have, we have provided more information. We now provide this chart that shows your relative rank score to the rest of the applicant pool. There's now information of whether you were deemed highly qualified or not. Uh, I totally hear that <laughs> folks want more and I'm willing to you know, consider and think about what some of those things might be. Yeah, I might also add to that just in the context of the fund. This is something we hear across all of our programs, and we have struggled over the years to find um, the right balance in, in how much information is um, important to share. Some people re may remember and this is when I back, started with the fund back in 2007, we actually, um, for some programs, used to give reviewer comments. And that was a lot of information, but it ended up not being that helpful because it was out of context. And so we've done a lot over the years across the programs to strip out um, subjectivity to make the scores be as objective as possible based off of the, the way that the questions were answered and rated. So the score is probably the best indicator or at least 
best information we can provide on how you fared in this particular round compared to these applicants, because it's not always the same groups and that sort of thing. Um, but we, we do struggle with that balance and trying to find out like what exactly would be helpful to you all, because once you get the debriefing, we then can't hop on the phone with all 200 groups and explain the debriefing to you. So we're still trying to work out that balance across all of our programs. That's great. I'll speak on behalf of Bob and say, I think the New Markets Tax Credit Coalition would like to give you some additional suggestions on that. Um, so we welcome continuing that conversation. I know we only have a couple of minutes left, so I will give you an open-ended question to say, are there parting words any of you would like to give about what you're up to these days or what we should be worried about or focused on or what you want us to remember about our conversation today? They're probably all waiting for me to <laughs> say something, although it's open for Trevor, Christopher, and Oscar to jump in. But I, I just want to thank you all and, and thank you, uh, Bob, for continuing to communicate and keep the, the lines open and to give us feedback. As you're mentioning, Meryl, we're always open to feedback and we're excited about the $5 billion over five years. We're excited to see you know, how much farther we can go into the qualified pool if we can give out larger allocations and make those policy decisions, not just this year, but for the next four and hopefully over the course of the next 20 years. And so I just appreciate the, the partnership and, and the input and the support that you've given the CDFI fund. Yeah, I, I would just echo the the feedback piece, particularly in a year, I mean, I think this is like the third time I've gone through this public comment and we got a lot more comments this time. And I really appreciate it. I hope that means that, uh, you know, people sort of heard the call because I feel like I was previewing it for a very long time that we were gonna do it. I know it takes a significant amount of time for everyone to respond and respond thoughtfully. And uh, I guess what I want to sort of leave you with is that even if you don't see an immediate, you know, oh, this question, oh, there's a new question in the application that directly addresses the comment that I made, that doesn't mean that you weren't heard and that we aren't continuing to think about this. We will be chewing on these comments for quite a long time because only so much as administratively feasible, you know, in the moment. Um, but uh, I want to thank everybody again for those thoughtful comments. And building on the feedback, um, part of it, um, I would, I think it's be helpful, you know, we do have our guidance materials, um, everything from how to report and our compliance FAQs. So those documents are helpful um, for you, but if there can be improved, if there you have suggestions, uh, we welcome them. So um, drop me an email, say, hey, this is something, you know, we don't understand or we would need a, um, better guidance on. Um, so I would just encourage you all to just, you know, provide feedback if we can provide better guidance in terms of how we, um, how we, stuff that we asked for in terms of reporting and so forth. So um, I want to thank Merrill, thank everyone from the CDFI fund. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Oscar, for joining us for an informative in, and interesting panel. I have a lot more questions that I couldn't type in time. So, so thank you again. And I am. I will now turn the uh, virtual uh, platform over to to Jose Villalobos to introduce our our speaker. Thanks everyone.